Mendoza here. I'm at uh, Brookdale Community College and I'm going to be giving a talk here shortly on the topic interviewing is the most important skill for success today. Where I'm going to cover the main idea that if you can't get a job, you can't do the job. And then there's this red thread that runs throughout the entire interview process from resume phone interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, reference checks, and the final decision. And that is that can you get the job done? So you will now see the actual presentation and then I'll get back to you afterwards with any closing comments that I have. Thank you. Today I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks a lot Sarah for setting this up. Just to kind of get an idea of who's in the room here, how many of you are currently interviewing? Okay, otherwise I'm assuming most of you are students. Probably soon will be interviewed. Okay, that's good. Because this is going to really help you. I wish I was in your position and I had somebody had given me this presentation. So what I'm going to share with you are ideas based on my personal experience, based on people that I coach. And I coach a lot of military veterans as they're making transition from military to civilian life. As I volunteer for this organization called Higher Heroes USA. And uh, this presentation that I'm going to be giving you today actually was given to them first. Because many of the military veterans have like 20, 30 years of experience and they have really never had to interview in military. So the Higher Heroes came to me and said, we need a presentation that really can speak to these people as they're about to go and start interviewing. And interviewing is a t totally different animal than when you're in the military. And there are a lot of things that have changed. It's much different than when I was joining the workforce than it is today. In a way, it's easier, but in a way, it's much more complex today. And I'm going to walk you through it. So a lot of the stuff at this point, uh, you're going to say, great, but Keep this debt because you will need all these skills. And there are a lot of skills that uh, go into interviewing. So let me just focus on the, on the title. Why did I title it Interviewing is the most important skill for success today? I'm sure you're like me, kind of overloaded with all the skills that you have to develop and master, right? Both hard skills and soft skills which I like to think of as the harder skills. But here's a simple thing to keep in mind. If you can't get the job, you can't do the job. It's that simple. If you can't get the job, you can't do the job, no matter what skills you have, no matter how good you think you are, no matter what degrees or credentials you have, it won't matter. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on, why this is the most important skill for success. Before I go further, let me introduce myself. I'm Jay Oza, and I want to thank Sarah McElroy there and the Brookdale Community College for inviting me to give this talk. It kind of speaks to the openness culture that you have here at Brookdale, that they're willing to expose you to different ideas from outside. So you guys are very lucky to be at Brookdale. Also, uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy uh, school schedule to attend this talk. And lastly, I want to thank Don here, <laughs> who's taking the video. You know, these days, if you give a talk and it doesn't appear on YouTube, did you actually give a talk? <laughs> right? No, you didn't. <laughs> so this will appear on YouTube so that you can review it if you miss anything. And also people who wanted to attend and couldn't will get to see it. OK. So, the idea of this presentation started in my head right after the 2016 election. I'm not going to go into politics, but let's focus on that. And the toughest job to get in this world is being the president of the United States. I don't, it's not even close. We make these candidates go through a real grueling two years, 18 month process. And in 2016, it came down to two candidates. One considered the most qualified to ever pursue the, that office. And the second one, the other one, 
the least qualified, and we know how it turned out. And people are still asking, how did he do it? It really comes down to four skills. And I'm focusing primarily on the interviewing aspect, not the political aspect. It's marketing, it's sales, it's performance, and it's negotiation. These are four skills that you need. Not only do you have to develop it, but you have to master these skills if you want to get a job. And once you get the job, then you get to use all these other skills that you're learning here at Brookdale. But you gotta get the job first, okay? So, like this job, how did I get this job? Because I consider any time you have a job, job is basically cut in quotes. We think of job as an employment, but this is a job for me. And it started when I gave a talk about uh, last fall in Middletown. And a woman saw me give a talk, and she wanted me to work with her children who were uh, interviewing, but they were not successful in landing the job. And based on my work, she asked a fundamental question. Would you be available to add this kind of value to Brookdale students? And I said, uh, definitely yes, because I had played so much tennis here at Brookdale in the 80s <laughs> that I said, it's time to pay back. So this is my paying back Brookdale <laughs> for all the tennis courts that I used, and I never paid for that. And she had a friend who works here at Brookdale. And she met her during the holidays and mentioned that. And her name was Suzanne. And Suzanne basically also had that one fundamental question. Can you add value to Brookdale students? And based on our conversation, she then passed the baton to Sarah. And Sarah and I spoke. And I sent her two speeches that I could potentially give to you. And we decided on giving this one. OK, so at this point, those were interviews. Okay, They were not formal sit-down interviews, but somebody could have basically ended it right at any, like the first woman could have said, no, this guy may not be interested. So she took the initiative and said, yes, there is something here that could potentially add value to Brookdale students. Okay, So she started it. Then Suzanne and I spoke. That was an interview, because she could have said, you know, the topic he has is just not going to add any value to Brookdale students. But she saw something in there, and she distributed this information that I sent to her to uh, certain folks within Brookdale. And Sarah said, I want to talk to Jay. So that was an interview, because Sarah could have said, you know, these students, this topic may not be appropriate for the students. But she said, yeah, this is something that will resonate. So that's how I'm here. Right now, I'm being interviewed. You guys are interviewing me. You have questions. One of the questions could be, when is he going to get to the second slide? I will get there. But uh, before I do that, let me point out something interesting here, because it kind of will go by pretty fast if I don't point it out. So below my name, this is my tagline. Guide people thrive on high stakes stage. Okay, And then below this are my titles, writer, speaker, executive coach. Now these, you have to remember this. This I consider as a conversation ender. This is a conversation extender. And the way you start introducing yourself, you can either open yourself up to have a further conversation with somebody, could open up opportunities. If I just said, I'm a writer, speaker, executive coach, that's me. That's me doing it. The, fir so the first one is what kind of outcome I'm generating to people. That's what you're interested in, not this. So at some point, you have to start getting comfortable in having a tagline. What are you actually delivering? So let's say if you're a hairstylist. If somebody introduced themselves and said, I'm a hairstylist, with me, that would be a conversation ender, naturally. But if somebody said, you know, I can tell you about what I my title, but what I really do is I give people confidence. Now that, the person is opening up. The, the natural question is, how do you do that? So now, there will be a conversation, and based on that, I could send my wife, I could send my daughter, I could send my son to get their hairstyle, because she's giving them confidence. So be careful. Start getting used to having a tagline on how you introduce yourself, because you meet a lot of people, and this is the place to do it. In college, you have to start experimenting. 
college you can do that because in college if you mess up, it doesn't matter, right? That's why you're here. Learn. Okay. A lot of this stuff is in my book, which you're all going to be getting it for free as an ebook. And this book will become very important now, but also after you get a job because you will be giving talks. You will be speaking a lot. And that's what I cover in my book. So you'll get my book along with some resources that I have, like a checklist and also a workbook. So next time when you have to give a talk, and one thing I want to point out, the two most important talks, I call it one most, uh, the most important, and the second one is the most dangerous. The most important is the introduction. It's the introduction, because if you don't introduce <coughs> yourself properly, you could end the conversation right away. You want to invite them to carry out a conversation. And then the second one I call it the dangerous is the impromptu. You know when people say, oh, he's good at thinking on his feet? I don't buy it. You gotta prepare. You can only think on your feet if you're prepared. So you have to, like if you're taking a class and you know the professor is going to ask you a question, you better prepare ahead of time. Anticipate that, or even volunteer. Show off if you have to. Okay, so I'm going to go now into the presentation. So this is an interview. The focus is going to be job from an employment standpoint, okay? So, but one thing I wanted to make clear, that interviewing is not necessarily for a job. It applies to anything. Job is what you call it a job. This is a job for me. So, these are the questions that the interview, interviewer is asking, but not directly. So, if I'm interviewing any of you, these are the questions I'm asking. I'm not going to ask you directly, <laughs> do you understand the job? That's what I'm asking. You know, I'm interviewing you. And during the conversation I'm having with you, I'm asking, does he really understand this job, the way you're answering the question? Let's say you do. The next question is the most important. <coughs> Can you actually do the job? The way you're answering the question, the way you're telling <coughs> the, the work you've done, the skills you have. If you've taken a course at Brookdale, great. How is that going to help me? I'm hiring you, right? So you've got to tell me how that skill that you learned in a particular course is going to help me get the job done. How are you going to help me get the job done? That's what I want to know. Because I'm hiring you to get the job done. That's very important. This is the most important question. As I like to think about it, it you know, in Greek mythology, if you remember, there's that uh, Theseus when he goes and slays Minotaur. I don't know if any of you took Greek mythology. I did. But <laughs> there's a red thread that his girlfriend gives him so that when he goes into the cave after he slays the minotaur, he uses the thread to come out of the, the cave. So the red thread that's running throughout an interview process is this one simple question. Can you get the job done? And you have to say it. You know, I can get the job done. Say it multiple times. At the end of the interview, they may not hire you, but they, they better not say that you cannot get the job done. Because you can't control whether you're going to get the job, but they got to know that you are convinced that you can get the job done. Keep that in mind. Then, also, it's very important, this question right here, do you want the job? You've got to say it. I want the job. And then these two come up, because nowadays companies are looking for a lot. So can you do even more? And then this one, are you fun to be around? Because you spent like 40%, now it's more than that. You know, in China, they have this thing called, have you heard of this? 996. Do you know what that stands for? Does anybody have? What 996 stands for is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Okay? And some companies have 997. Think about that. So you're spending a lot of time at work. So these are the fundamental questions that the interviewer is asking when you're interviewing for a job. And it's up to you to make sure that you are addressing these questions. OK. I'm going to focus on three things in this <coughs> talk. Resume, phone interviews, and face-to-face. -face. And face-to-face -face is the most important interview. Resume is where it starts. And the one thing you have to know about a resume is that a resume is not a static document. Resume is a dynamic document. 
You just don't write a resume and then just say, I'm just going to send that same resume to any company that's interested. That's when you get, I sent 500 resumes and I didn't get any response because your resume wasn't speaking to the company, what you can do. So resume is a dynamic document, but resume has gotten very tricky. Most of us, when we send a resume, <coughs> is not going to be viewed by a person. It's going to be viewed by a machine or software, application tracking system. Okay? So when you send a resume on a website, a person, unless, unless you know somebody, uh, some, somebody like networking, who's going to hand the resume to somebody, a hiring manager, then that's a different thing. Then you don't give them. So this, is, this resume application tracking system is a skills-based resume. So if you've taken courses in um, audiovisual, you really need to make this resume speak to your skills because that's what the application tracking system is looking for. And when it sees the right words and stuff, that it, it has, it's algorithmic driven. We don't know what they're putting in. But it needs to see skills because machine is not talking to you. It's looking at your resume that you sent. And if it likes it, then it will select you and send it to a, a recruiter. And that's when you get a call from a recruiter, right? The, the second one <laughs> is the one for the people. This is a resume, once the recruiter contacts you, you say, okay, I will send you a different resume. And this one is more like a narrative that speaks to your overall value that you're going to provide. So this is a different resume. Most people don't do this. They have one resume and they use it for everything. And that's not a good idea. It's not effective. And this is a very important point because people get frustrated and Resume is where it starts, and you don't want to screw up right from the beginning. So then we get to the third one. The best resume is when you don't even have to send a resume. So how do you do that? You have to show like a portfolio. You got to create blogs that shows that you, under, you understand the industry, that you have some insight. No, you all work. There's some job that you have done. There is some kind of insight that you have gained. And you have to write it. Somewhere you have to blog it or you make a video, but people need to see that. If they see that, they will view you in a totally different light. If one person sends a resume that's paper-based or uh, electronic-based, and you are sending along with it, hey, by the way, take a look at this video. Take a look at this blog that I've written. Suddenly you stand out. You stand out immediately. Like if I got a resume and I just see a resume, but if you send me a video link on YouTube that you have created, I'm going to pay attention to that. So keep that in mind, okay? And these are the fundamental two questions that usually that you want to focus on with the resume. Do you understand the job, and can you do the job? And the purpose of this is to eventually talk to the recruiter on the phone. But before you talk to the recruiter on the phone, you want to make sure that the recruiter is going to see this resume. She already has this one, but you want to make sure that he or she sees this resume. Okay, so let's move on to the next step. Is this clear? Because I just want to make sure, because resume is where it starts. And I don't want you to think that once you get some person who's helping you with the resume, it ends right there. The resume has got to be constantly tweaked. You're writing a resume for the machine based on the job description. Then you're writing a resume for the uh, the recruiter, and then this is where it gets really tricky. You want to write a resume that really speaks to the hiring manager. It's not the same resume because the, the hiring manager understands the job completely <coughs> differently than the recruiter, and you want to make sure your resume is speaking to the hiring manager. It's work, but look, if you want to get a good high paying job, this is what you got to do today. Okay. So then we get to the next step. And the next step is you're going to get on the phone, and first you're going to be talking to the recruiter. But you don't want to get too ahead of the game. You want to find out what exactly is the recruiter interested in talking to you about. So I would find out what are the three areas that the recruiter wants to talk to you. You don't want to get on the phone quickly, because you want to make sure you've got the recruiter, the, the other resume. 
and then you set up a time and you talk. Now this is where a lot of people make a second mistake. We already talked about the mistake that people make with the resume. The second mistake they make, the recruiter should be your friend. So they're trying to screen you whether you are a good fit. You have to really screen the, uh, the recruiter and get as much information as possible because that's intelligence that you're gathering. The more intelligence you gather will give you an opportunity to tweak the resume before you send it to the hiring manager. So do not just get on the phone and answer questions the recruiter has. And I have a, uh, uh, when, you send, when you see the deck, I have some questions, the qualifying questions that you can ask. So the thing I like to think about this whole interview process is it's a targeted, qualified performance. That's what it is. Targeted, because your resume is targeting. Qualified, this is where qualification takes mm -hmm. place. And a lot of people that I coach do not qualify opportunity. I'll give you an example. I recently coached a, a college student, and uh, he had an interview. I had spent an hour and a half prepping him. After the interview, he tells me that, Jay, I got ambushed. And I said, what? How did you get ambushed? We'd spent like an hour and a half. He had actually multiple sessions. And he said, they really started asking me some real nitty gritty questions about, on Excel. And I said, but before you went there, didn't you ask them what they wanted to cover in that face-to-face -face interview? He didn't do it. So he got ambushed. I don't want that to happen to you guys. Spend time right here. Don't get too anxious. Don't get too uh, interested in saying, oh, they're interested. I'll go and have a face-to-face -face interview. Take your time. Because you want to make it count. Okay, unless you want to practice. But you know, part of the practice is you want to get good at this. Because this is a skill now. Interviewing is a skill. And like I said, it is the most important skill. Now here, there are three questions that come up. Do you understand the job? Can you do the job? And do you want the job? So you see that? The questions don't change as you go from one step to the other step. These are the fundamental questions. They don't change. The rest of it, it's up to you to put it in this bucket. If you don't do that well, then you're making the interviewer all confused. It's your job to have that clarity. If you make the interviewer think too hard, they're going to move to another candidate. So your job is to simplify things for the interviewer. The more you simplify it, the better your chances are. You start resonating with the interviewers. And it should be fun. They should not be high stress if you've done all the preparation here. OK, so at this point, let's say you did all of it. You have now found out exactly what the hiring manager is looking for. And you ask the recruiter, can you ask these questions to the hiring manager and get back to me? Maybe something like that. And whatever she or he tells you, that should be in your resume that you want him or her to send to the hiring manager. So when the hiring manager looks at it and says, my god, this person really gets it. And suddenly, now you're not going to be interviewing. Guess what you'll be doing? You're going to be having a conversation. And that's what you want. You want to have a conversation. Because if you interview, that means you're on defense. And you can't score when you're on defense. That's how it works. Okay? If you're interviewing, you're practically saying, just throw anything at me and hopefully I'll catch it. That's not the way you want to interview. You want to be on offense. And I'll show you how you get on offense. So now we come to the so-called the Super Bowl. For most of us, a face-to-face -face interview is our Super Bowl. That's high stakes for us. Because a lot of these interviews will determine our career, our livelihood, and our future. This is as high stakes as it gets for all of us. You've got to take it seriously. Because if you don't do well here, you can't get ahead, you can't get a good job, and you can't get ahead in your career. This is your Super Bowl, face-to-face -face interviews. Unless you have football talent and can play for the New England Patriots, but most of us don't have that skill. Now, there are three things. One thing, let me just put a point out right here. Face-to-face -face interview, never go to a face-to-face -face interview without this. Even if you just have a title, take it. Because you're not there, you're there to do the job. You're not there to interview. So I did this once. That's how I, I, I came up with this idea. So I'd gone to an interview. At that time, I didn't call it value delivery plan. I just called it the 90-day plan. And I had it, and I 
was interviewing, I said, you know, by the way, I already started thinking about this job and I created a plan. And immediately, the manager wanted to see it. And I had nothing in there. Just basic stuff like template, like, you know, communication plan, uh, training plan, things like that. So just have a template, because it's tentative. It shows that you're ready to do the job the first day. And you know, many of these companies, they don't have it. So if you already go there with a tentative 90-day plan, you suddenly stand out. You're there to do the job the first day you're hired. That's very important. So here are the things that I think before you, have, before you go to a face-to-face -face interview, you have to prepare. You've got to have a message. Why your message? That's what they'll remember after the interview. You'll be, like at this point, there's a lot of words that I'm going to be saying here, but the simple message is this. If you can't get the job, you can't do the job. That's the message. So after you leave, somebody will ask you, hey, what was that presentation about? And you're going to say, if you can't do the job, you can't get the job. That's what I learned. That's what I want you to remember. But the question is, when you go for an interview, what is going to be your message? Because if you don't have a message, and they move on to another candidate, they've forgotten you already. Make sure you have a message. Work on it. Test it out. Start doing it right now. Also, you don't want to just show up without knowing what they want to talk to you about. Because remember, you're not going to be interviewing. You're going to be having a conversation. And conversation means they got to tell you ahead of time. And you can ask. This is not like college, where you can't ask the professor, hey, professor, what's going to be on the <laughs> test? OK? You can ask here. This is real world. Hey, before I attend the interview, can you tell me three areas you want to focus on? No, we can't do that. Faf. You're not going to get in that. Believe me. They will tell you what they want to talk to you about. And you're going to do it. And when you do it, you're going to stand out. OK, so I know at Brookdale, you're thinking about tests and all that. But once you leave Brookdale, you've got to change your mindset. It's all different. It's a new ballgame now. Start preparing your summary ahead of time. OK? You got to be prepared. When you're going for a face-to-face -face interview, these are things you got to do it ahead of time because you're not going to think during the interview, you know, hey, by the way, I forgot my summary. Can I come back again? No, it's too late. And then also start drafting your thank you email ahead of time. So as soon as you leave the interview, if you have to tweak something, you can do it. Bing. Wow, this company sent us a thank you letter already. Things people remember. Remember, an interview in a sense is like a proxy for a job. Because they're trying to determine. There is like uncertainty, and there's a risk they're taking. The more certainty you create, the, the less risky you become. Suddenly, that gets noticed. And the other thing that gets noticed, which I didn't say yet, being better doesn't get you noticed. You have to be different. If you're just a little bit better, if she's a little bit better than you, that doesn't get noticed. But if you're totally different, like, you know, all these people, they were pretty much the same, but then this guy really stood out. He did things that I didn't even expect, and you know, we're going to give him the job. That's what they're thinking. So try to be different. Don't say, oh, I'll be just a little bit better. You know, I'll answer this question. Like, I remember one time I was talking to this guy, and he was so happy. Somebody had asked him in, a, in an interview, how many cows are in Canada? And he was actually so happy. He said, Jay, you know, I got that right. I said, dope. They weren't really trying to find an answer. That's a question you can look it up on Google right now and get the answer. You're not supposed to think about that. But he thought that would get him the job. And guess what? He didn't get the job. OK, so here, since this is a face-to-face -face interview, all five questions <coughs> come into play. This is your last chance. This is performance time. This is Beyonce, Bruce, LeBron, this face-to-face -face interview for all of us. These five questions, you've got to address it. Do you understand the job? Can you do the job? Do you want the job? Can you do more? And are you fun to be around? That's like the beer test. And I'm going to drill down into this more. But if you do this part well, you will stand out. And either you, at that point, are going to be meeting with the CEO or somebody, the your hiring manager's boss, or you'll walk away with an offer. And then you can decide whether you want to take it or not. Sounds easy, right? There's a lot of work here. So now let's drill down a little bit more this face-to-face -face interviews. This is how I would do it, OK? So what I'm telling you is not some things I picked up elsewhere. This is how I would interview. This is exactly how I interview any time I want any kind of job, OK? So 
one of the things we said was, you're not going to interview. You're going to have a conversation. So before you even do that, you want to start reframing the interview so that the person knows that this guy is coming to have a conversation. So you can just send an email to the hiring manager. Hey, before I come to have a strategic conversation with you, and I'll define the word strategic, do you have any questions that you have so that we can have a real good conversation? So you're already setting the, the hiring manager to think about you. Hey, this guy's already sent me an email. I better do my homework. Otherwise, I'm going to look like a fool if he's coming to have a conversation and I cannot have that conversation. So you don't want to go cold. You want to prep, let them prep ahead of time. Because you want them to also want to have a good conversation with you because they're going to be making the decision. So this word strategic, what does that mean? And that's a very important word. When you are being hired a full time for a position, Companies today don't need to hire you full-time. They can d get work done part-time. They can get work done abroad. So when they're saying that you're a full-time employee, you automatically become strategic. Strategic means that they have choices, and they want to work. <coughs> and if they pick you, then you become strategic. And start thinking that way. They may not use that word, but you have to start thinking that way. Because remember, many of you are going to get that first job and that first job will eventually lead to a career. And this is a skill. If you don't develop this skill, it's going to be hard to have a good career. Because this skill is going to get used and used over and over again. Because once you get a job, you're still going to be interviewing to get promoted. So you really have to start getting into that interview mindset. So in order to have a conversation, you have to design it. And designing means that you got to, this is something should be familiar with you when you write essays. There should be an opening, there should be a middle, there should be a closing, and there should be a follow-up. You have to start designing ahead of time. Okay? So let's see what this would look like. So opening. Opening really, you want to focus. So, base, so, so you, let's say you're interviewing and you say, look, before I continue, say the person doesn't get that you're having a conversation. So look, before, we before you ask any question, I have some three questions that I just want to uh, ask so that I can focus on what's important to you. And the first one is, you may not want to ask this directly, like what the, basically what you're trying to do is you want to get the job description and the resume off the table quickly. Because that's what you did in the resume part and the phone conversation. At the phone conversation, you kind of validated your background. And if they are happy with your background, then you don't want to bring it up again in a face-to-face -face interview. You want to focus on the future. The past is over. You already did that work. So past, you should take care of it on the phone. In the future, you take care of it in a face-to-face -face interview. That's an important thing to remember. So let's say you don't want to ask the job description. You could just say, let me make sure I understand the job. So you can just say, this is how I understand the job. Is this correct? And if it's not, let the interviewer correct you, saying, oh, this is the, really the job. So job description, get that off the table. <coughs> then these two things you got to get. What are the three things you like about my background? you got to hear it from them. You might say, I have leadership skills, I have good communication skills, and I have good collaboration skills. That's what you think. What you think doesn't matter. What the interviewer thinks really matters. So ask them, hey, now that you had a chance to look at my resume, what are the three things that really stands out? And they got to tell you that. If you don't hear from them, that means on the phone interview, you did not bring that out. You may have asked that in the phone interview, but ask again. So you can ask again, and they say, these are the three things we like. Good. Remember that, because that will become part of your summary, that these are the three things they really like about me. But you also need to bring this up. This is the elephant in the room. If you were so good, they wouldn't be interviewing you. They would already have sent you a job offer letter. But since they're interviewing, they have some lingering concern. A lot of times, the concern has to do with whether you're going to fit into their culture. Okay. Another concern that may come up with many of you here, lack of experience. Because you guys are just getting started. How do you handle that? That'll come up. You know, we really like your background, but there's this one concern we have. The lack of experience. Never disagree. Agree. You know, Mr. Interview, you're absolutely right. 
but at the end of it, it'll become less of a concern. Never say it, it's not gonna be a concern. It'll be less of a concern, because you cannot change people's model. So if they have a concern, that's the elephant in the room, you can't say, oh, no, no, you're just completely, that's not gonna happen, I, I can do the job. No, they have a legitimate point there. You don't have the experience, but now the way you interview, it should become less of a concern. But don't disagree with them. So that's the opening. So now you're set. This is sort of like, if I may use the football analogy, this is the kickoff. They tell you, you know, you've got to go this way. Now you know exactly what you have to do. You've taken care of the three important <coughs> questions. So now we get to the, oh, now we get to the middle. So I have to, since I'm using football analogy, there is this football, green zone is in the middle, and red zone. Are you, who's familiar with the red zone in football? Red zone, okay, so many of you are not. So red zone is called red zone because that's where you have the best opportunity to score a touchdown. That means you're gonna be scoring a touchdown. That's why it's called the red zone. So green zone, if I may use the football analogy, so let's say you're having an interview and they're just lobbying questions back and forth and you think you know, you're answering questions. In my opinion, you're actually in the green zone because you're not bringing it, you're not scoring any touchdowns. You're not taking any risks in the interview. And when you're not taking risks, you're just trying to be better than somebody else. And better doesn't win, different wins. Keep that in mind. Better doesn't win, different wins. But you definitely don't want to be here. That means they're scoring on you. They're telling you you're no good. So you want to make sure that this has already been taken care of during the phone interview. They don't have any real lingering concerns. The one concern they can have, whether you fit or not, that's valid. But they can't have more than one. That should have been addressed during the phone interview. So now, how do you score in the red zone? OK. So you've got to score touchdowns with plays to win the job. What are the plays? Because one of the questions that you asked was what are the three areas, three hot button areas? And they say, you know, the three things we need in the candidate are these three things. We need them to understand customer experience. We need them to be a problem, they need to have problem solving skills, and they need to know how to build relationship. Great, now you prepare. Now you've got the plays. You've got to use this up. You can't just leave the interview with this thing in your pocket. You've got to use it up. This is the risk that you've got to take. And you've got to figure out how to bring it into the conversation. Okay, so let's go through one of them in more detail. This is, I call it the money slide here. This is where you're going to demonstrate that, you're gonna demonstrate many skills here. The, the number one skill you're demonstrating is your thinking skills. That you can take something from the top, from the top level all the way to the point where you've become from a candidate to an employee. That's what I call the candidate to an employee moment. So let's start with the first one. Now let's just say, for this sake, you worked at McDonald's, okay? And you're going for a job. And you know that customer experience is very important. How are you going to show that the McDonald's experience you have qualifies you for the job that you're interviewing for? Okay, you all worked at McDonald's. And you all been to McDonald's. So you say, customer experience is how you win today in business. That's the top level, that's sort of like you know, make America great again type of message, that's your message right here. The customer experience that nobody can disagree with you. That's how you win today in business. Customer experience is how you win. Then you get to this level two. Level two, you've got to go more detailed. What is the process? How does that even happen? What exactly is customer experience? And you can say, customer experience comes down to respect. In order to show respect to customers, you have to be responsive, you have to be reliable, and you have to have relationship. <coughs> then you move to level three. So now you've given them three things. Respect is tied to being responsive. Reliability means you can get the job done the way the customer wants it, and you're building relationship. Okay, then you get to three and you can elaborate on, on this in more detail, which I'm not gonna do it here, kind of get the point. Then you get to level four. Now you've got a level set, okay. So at this point, you have kind of given them an idea. You kind of showed the process that, that you follow to deliver customer experience. But now you need that one universal example. And you can pick for any place that you feel have delivered good customer experience. So I put some name here. So let's take Apple, for example. I'll give you my personal example. So at the end of last year, 
I wanted to replace my battery. And I called Apple, and they were busy, and they said that uh, you can leave your number and somebody will call you back shortly. And they are very fast, by the way. Or you can stay on, and while you're staying on, what kind of music would you like to listen to? So they gave me choice. And I'm like, what? I hope this is not something they're trying to figure out, what kind of music I like. So they said, do you want to listen to classical music? Do you want to listen to <coughs> jazz? Or do you want to listen to pop? And I'm like thinking now, wow, I've never been given that kind of choice before. <laughs> they put some crummy music and I'm kind of subjected to that. So I said jazz. So I listened to it for a minute and then the guy came out. And I said, you know what? I don't know what the guy said, but I do remember they gave me that choice where I had to pick the music. I call that a good customer experience. So now if I say that in an interview, you're not going to disagree with that, right? Because that's how I felt, that I'm entitled to my, what I think is a good customer experience. Then. You now move to level five. This, where you can have any job that you have. You could be at working at McDonald's. And you say, well, let me tell you how I delivered customer experience when I was working at McDonald's. And then you talk about it, how you did it. OK, so now you have done a lot of work here. But you're not finished. Because this is, comes down to, this is the mistake that a lot of people make in job interviews when they're face to face. They do this, they tell. You've got to go from tell to sell. And from sell, you're not done. You've got to close it. So here, you're now collaborating, saying, what do you think? You know, what do you do that's different? So now you're a I'm asking you, tell me, what do you think? I'm, you know, you're the interviewer, and you'll tell me, you know, what you said makes a lot of sense. We do pretty much most of what you said. Great. Close it now. Close it right here. This is where you've got to close it now. So what you've now done is, you basically are aligned. They, the interviewer agrees with you. Now you can say, well, let's team up and deliver on the customer experience so the company can make money. You can win. At that point, you just went from a candidate to an employee. What more do they want? You can't do anything more. Does this slide make sense? This is like the framework that I would use. And you can do this for any hot button skills. You got to take it. Let me tell you, there are a lot of people who don't know this. If you know this, you're going to beat your competition. Because this, I call it the money slot. If you master this and how to do, like I said, there can only be three things. Because otherwise, if there's just too many, it's unreasonable. Maybe it's only one. Maybe it's only just customer experience. But let's say there's another one, problem solving, which I will send you in the deck on how I would do problem solving. And then the third one, let's say, is relationship building. But you can come up with things saying, you know, what are the three hot button issues for you that, are, that makes you successful, that'll make uh, me a good candidate? And they'll tell you. And then you go down and create this type of a slide and practice it and deliver it. This is the performance time. And if you perform, you will walk away with an offer because there's not much more you can do because that's a pretty detail because there are so many skills there that you're bringing up. There's a thinking skill, there's a communication skill, there is a collaboration skills, there's like salesmanship, there's performance, there are so many skills in that one slide. The whole interview face to face is performance. It, you're not selling, you're performing. Because if you perform, then they're gonna say, hey, this guy looks like he can do the job. Because you're not doing the job, you gotta perform that job. The only way you can perform it is how you interview. That makes sense. Now you've got to close it out. So you've done a lot, but you're still not done. Closing is very important. You've got to get this feedback. Mr. Interview, do you think I understand the job? Yes. Do you think I can do the job? Yes. At this point, you are practically done, because there's nothing more you can do. They just told you. You understand the job, and you can do the job. OK. This one. You want to bring up compensation in a delicate manner because at the end, this is still a business transaction. And if you don't talk money, because money has a way of changing the conversation. So you just want to bring it up saying, hey, you know, because if they're hiring you and let's say it's a sales job and you don't bring up money, then the question is, how are you going to bring up money when you're talking to customers? So you do want to bring this up. Compensation is something, you're not going to negotiate here, just want to make sure, but you just want to get an idea and don't negotiate. I just want to get an idea what the salary range is. OK, you got it out of the way. Up to you. Some people say, no, that's not a good idea. I disagree. Now you're going to summarize. 
Now, summary is basically you're going to make sure you address those questions. Do you understand the job? They already told you you do. Can you do the job? Go into your skill set and say, these are the, the skills that I have that makes me a highly qualified candidate for this job. And then, I call it the Simba moment. What is that? You remember that movie? Lion King, you may be you too young. Bear Simba couldn't wait to be king. Remember that song? Yeah. I can't wait to be king. Only one person. Okay. <laughs> okay. Whoa, everybody now. So that's the Simba moment, okay? So here, you don't have to get into a song and dance here, but you can say, I just can't wait to get started. Can you do that? I can't wait to get started. And you know what? If they smile, you got the job. If they look scared, you're not getting the job, okay? <laughs> so, so just say that at the end. I can't <laughs> wait to get started. Because if you can't wait to get started, because if th two, three candidates go and you're the only one that said, I just can't wait to get started, you're going to get the job. Because at the end, I want to give the job to somebody who really wants it. And you're telling them, I want it. I perform. At this point, I can do the job. I want to get started right now. Okay, follow up. You can read this, but this is something that I would highly recommend. Always try to arrange, if you went on a face-to-face -face interview, a 15-minute call, not to change their mind if you don't get the job, or maybe you didn't accept the job. This is part of your networking now, because these people have spent, you have spent, and they have spent a lot of time. Every person you met should be part of your network. And you may, let's say, didn't get the job. Something may open up. And if you have interviewed well, they will remember you. Because you know, at the end, there could be two candidates, or maybe it turned out that you were a long shot. And they had somebody that was just a safe choice, and they gave that person a job. But they liked the way you interviewed. A position may open up, and you're going to get a call. So do not think that, oh, I didn't get the job. I'm done. Forget it. I'm never going to apply to that. Bad idea. Real bad idea. Get on a call and have a 15-minute call and just say, hey, by the way, if you can, what could I have done better? Is there anything? I appreciate it. I understand you, uh, you selected somebody else. You're OK with that. Uh, don't say you made a mistake or anything, because they didn't. They picked whoever they thought was right for them. But uh, let them know that if anything opens up, I'm still interested. And they may know other people they may recommend. And get, get on their LinkedIn. Join their network. So that keep them up to date. Maybe you write a blog or a video. They know about it. So they become part of your network. A lot of people just don't do it. When they don't get the job, they just like, ah, I'm done with it. I don't think that's a good idea. OK? So at this point, you now understand resume, that it's a dynamic document. The phone call, phone interview is qualifying. That's where you qualify. And the face-to-face -face interview is where you perform. So you are, it's a targeted, qualified performance. That's what you want to do. And then this red thread that is running throughout is this question. Can you get the job done? Right from the resume to the phone interview, face-to-face, -face, reference checks, which I, I'm not going to get to cover here in decision time. And one thing I want to point out something that performance is very important. <sighs> performance essentially sells you. You don't need to sell, the performance sells. Because performance persuades people. And performance is really the truth. Because if you perform, <clears throat> they think you are the one they're looking for. Whether it's in politics, whether it's in job, or anything, you've got to have a performance. You know, on TV, when somebody goes before a congressional hearing, they always talk about, you know, he really performed well. They never say, did he answer this question? It's always the performance. So keep that in mind. In any situation, you're always interviewing. <coughs> always make sure you have the performance that's going to move people. You know, I always tell people, you know, you have FedEx. They move packages. We're all in business called HeadX. We're moving ideas from one head to the other heads. That's what we do. That's all we do. And performance is how it happens. OK? So that's it. I want to wish you for coming. And at this point, I'll open it up for Q&A. And I'll tell you, there's a lot here. So if something went over your head, it's OK. Just remember that interviewing is the most important skill. Because if you can't get the job, 
you can do the job. Okay, thank you very much. So at this point, I'll open up for Q&A comments or anything that didn't clear. There are certain slides that I didn't get a chance to go through. If anybody wants to stick around, I can go through them. But uh, at this point, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. I know for um, a lot of the students here and myself, uh, applying to other colleges, this same process can be used in applying to go for interviews at the college for acceptances? Yeah, like I said, in colleges, because when you're filling out, you're writing an essay, a lot of colleges ask you for essay, and some actually even interview you. It shouldn't be any different from, from this, because your essay should be answering that fundamental question, what the colleges are asking, like, why should we admit you? Why should we admit you? What are you going to do here? So that's, you have to answer that. That's the question. They're not going to ask that, t tell us why we should admit you, but that's the fundamental question. And then when you, if you get a face-to-face -face interview, then you have to really prepare and address that fundamental question. And you've got to go in with your game. You've got to have a message. You've got to know ahead of time what they want to discuss with you. You never want to go in any interviews blind. Because interviews is about gathering intelligence. The more intelligence you gather, the better you will be in standing out. So don't ever be afraid of asking. Ask. Saying, you know, I think I now know everything. Yeah. But even if you don't say, listen, I still am not clear on some things I need to talk to you about. Because once you're there, at that point, you're having a conversation where you're going to be performing. And you don't want things coming up that you could have taken care of during the phone interview. You, don't, you can have multiple calls with the recruiter and even the hiring manager. But once you get to face to face, the burden is on you to walk away with an offer. If you do not walk away with an offer, then you have to ask yourself, where did I mess up? Did it, was it in the resume phase, or was it at the, the phone interview phase? Now, if it gets down that they're down to two candidates and they selected somebody else, then there's nothing you can do about that. But you've got to go all out and get the offer. And then you can decide whether you want to accept it. But once you take a face-to-face -face interview, you've got to walk away with an offer. You've got to go with that mindset. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so when preparing for the face-to-face -face interview, I have here um, tentative 90-day value delivery plan. Is that the message, or what would be an example of a message? Like, say you were doing a McDonald's job or an accounting job or whatever. Right. What would be your, an example of the message? The message would be, depending on how, a lot of times you can get that from their website, like what exactly is their mission? So I just say their mission back to them, kind of? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they tell them, you know, uh, like, oh, so I'll give you an example. So one time I was interviewing somebody who had an interview at uh, Amazon. His name was uh, Jelani. And uh, he was in the military, and he had an interview, and, and he was getting a little worried, like, oh, my God, I just have a few days. I don't know what to do. And they asked me whether I'd be available to talk <coughs> to Jelani. So I said, yeah. So I said, Jelani, listen, I don't know what they're going to ask you. But if I were you, after every question that they ask you, after every answer, just say, it's all about customers. That was his message. Okay. And he got the job. <laughs> I don't know if that okay. did it or not, I but I said it. that that was your message. It's all about customers. And if you keep saying that, they may not hire you, but they're not going to say that this guy doesn't understand that his job is all about customers. Okay. And he did that exactly to the teeth. And he texted me. And he also did that uh, the Simba moment that I told him. I just came up with that Simba moment. You don't have to call it Simba moment. <laughs> I like it because it's a, yeah, it's like everybody likes Simba. so. But uh, he did that, and he, he act afterward he texted me and said, you know, Jay, I also, and uh, the lady smiled. I said, I don't know whether you're going to get the job, but my bet is that you will. And he got the job. So. I got a question. Yeah, sure. Can you be too different? You don't want to be, OK. You don't want to be way off the wall, right. OK? So you can be, you've got to, what I'm saying by different is you've got to take some risks. I mean, if you become totally risk averse, then you're basically saying, I hope they notice my being better than other candidates they're looking at. That's actually a good question. So you don't want to do things that are completely going to make them think like, this guy is completely not going to, because you also want to fit into the culture, too. 
if it doesn't, because remember, you want to walk away with the job offer. So you've got to kind of calibrate how different. What I did here, there's nothing really offensive or anything here, right? I'm just basically gathering intelligence. I'm just, I have a right to ask questions. Like, before I did this talk, you know, I called Sarah. I said, Sarah, can I come and take a look at this place? And she said, yeah, sure. She didn't say, no, we don't do that, you know? You've got to come in and do it cold. I asked about the students. I said, you know, can you tell me a little bit about the students, what they'd be looking for? So I gathered intelligence. So I had to, in fact, because of that, I had to take away some slides because I didn't want to completely overwhelm you with it. But you've got to take some risk. OK? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Guys are asking good questions. Any more? Like, what kind of questions are they asking you when you're interviewing? Anybody here? Anything that, like, I wasn't, a, I wasn't prepared for that. Anybody getting that, those type of questions? You guys are all, think you can do all this? I got another one. Yeah. What do you think, so, um, what should you be going for when they ask, like, what's, what do you want to be doing for five years from now? And that seems like it's a common question. Yeah, I, personally, I don't really, you just basically say, look, I don't know what's going to happen for five years, because nobody can predict the future. But I know one thing, that if I, provide value to you, the customers, and if I keep on building my skills, that will take care of it. Because that's the only thing you control. Because if you say, well, you know, I'd like to be a CEO. <laughs> 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 They're going to be like, wow, this guy is really ambitious, maybe too ambitious. That's really being different, you know? You can say, you know, I'd like your job. I don't, I don't, I'm not advise that. <laughs> I see myself taking over your job. So you want to say, listen, I mean, you may, but I would not say it. I'm not, I'm not going to take that kind of risk. But uh, what I'm saying is that you want to show that you have, you know how to add value to the company, to the customer. So if you're taking care of the customers, then the company's going to do well. And if the company's doing well, and you're already interviewing, so let's say you already got a job. That's a good question. Okay, so let's say, what would I do? So you got a job. Okay, what is your name, if I may ask the first name? Zach. Zach, so Zach got a job. Now he's done all the stuff that we covered here. You don't stop. You're going to be networking. You're going to keep track of what you're doing. And you're going to let your boss know. You're going to ask your boss, what is your problem that I can offload from you? So suddenly, Zach is already doing the job that his boss is doing. And the boss either leaves or gets promoted. Guess who they're going to look at to promote? Zach's going to get that job. So you can't suddenly say, oh, I got the job. Now I'm happy. And I'm going to just, uh, you know. Relax. You don't relax. Today you can't relax. Career requires work. If you want to have a, you guys are very young. And if you don't get off to a good start. See, one of the things I did not mention in this presentation is this. When companies are hiring you, they are taking, it's an investment they're making. And they say that if a, per, if a person doesn't work out, the cost, opportunity cost, is 15 times your base salary. But the other thing they never talk about is the risk that the investment you're making. If you make a bad decision, let's say you take a job, it doesn't work out. It could completely ruin your career. So this is something you don't take lightly. Because there are a lot of people, and these days you've got to be very strategic with your career choices you make. Because one bad move is all it takes, and you may not be able to recover. Like a lot of people, when they get into their uh, late, of 40s and 50s, if they lose their job at the salary that they're getting, they're never going to match that salary again. They're not going to get that job again. So you have to constantly be in this interviewing mindset. And things are changing now. So let's say you have certain skills and you get the job, and you worked at a company for 10 years. And if you have not become more marketable, then you are in trouble if that company gets rid of you. So I know right now that's just kind of like, wait, that's way down the line. But I want you to start thinking about it now, that you've got to get into this mindset now so that you can have a really good career. OK? If anybody wants uh, uh, to do questions after, if anybody has questions, I'll be around for a while. OK? Again, thank you very much for attending. And I hope this was helpful. Right, thank you. Thank you.